Hidden in the depths of the mind is a secret tomb where knowledge, fear, mystery, and a macabre sense of enjoyment is held. Each corner is resplendent with its own curiosities, and each curiosity appeals to a different soul. You're listening to The Crypt of the Unknown, a podcast that discusses the realms of the horrific and the fantastic in print, games, or on the screen. And now, introducing you to the Guardians of the Crypt, your tour guides, here are Webb and Stefan J.D. Welcome, weary travelers, to the Crypt of the Unknown, where we will dive into the depths of things that range from the horrific to the comical. And by comical, I mean comic book, as is such for the subject today. I am... Webb, the critical android, and joining me for this conversation, as he's going to be joining for all the conversations, is my friend and colleague, Stefan. Hello. How are you doing, good sir? I am doing okay today. It is a early, beautiful, hot summer day in Arizona. Uh, it's 115 degrees outside. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'd be dead. Yeah, it's uh, literal hell, so here we go. My circuits would be melting. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I, I see here in um, upstate New York. I mean, we we've been having high temperatures as well, but for us, high temperatures are like uh the mid nineties with humidity, and and that's a big difference at high humidity. But even then, I mean, it's not one hundred and fifteen. Uh, that's that's something else. Yeah, truly, uh, humidity is uh, that can be killer too in its own way. Yeah, I mean. Together with no matter what you're fighting with those temperatures and that humidity, it's going to be just unbearable. So uh, I'm glad that you were able to crawl yourselves out of the depths of uh, the brimstone to uh, join us. Yeah, uh, I'm guessing it's even more harder to be in New York around this time of year if you're wearing a spider suit. Oh, I imagine it would be, as is such for the discussion today, where we go from uh, facing hell in real life to reading about a kind of hellish situation uh, as we talk about Spider-Man Maximum Carnage. Yes, a very uh, overbloated story <laughs> that Marvel decided to capitalize on from the fame of the symbiote Venom. Yeah, and I, I almost hesitate to say the names of the people involved in this, but because <laughs> I don't know if they want this on their on their record, but Obviously, this is one of those ones that's across multiple different series of Spider-Man, but it was written by Tom DeFalco, J.M. DeMattius, Terry Cavanaugh, and David Michelini, and illustrated by Mark Bagley, Sal Buscema, Ron Lim, Tom Lyle, and Alex Saviuk. And I've read somewhere, I think it was through, uh, there was a TV Tropes uh, link that went to an article where they were discussing... Uh, different parts of the Spider-Man mythos and uh, different contributions that were being made. And that one of the people who they interviewed, I can't remember the person's name, but said that around the offices, this this series was known as Maximum Garbage because they detested having to work on this. Ah, uh, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely before they got into the real garbage that is the Clone Wars saga. I haven't read it, but that's just what I've heard. Oh my gosh, if if this is this bad, I can only imagine how bad the Clone Saga was. Yeah, there's. I actually know more about that backstory than this one. This one seems to, seems like they were having a little too much fun to try and make a more coherent, fun story. It's it's all over the place. Well, before we dive into it, I'd, I'd like to hear what your introduction to this was to see if it was similar to mine. Like, how were you introduced to Maximum Carnage? So... It was around the same time. It had to have been the, as I, people soon to come find out on the show that um, Webb, the android here, is a SNES player and I am a Sega player. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I uh, got this originally, the video game Maximum Carnage on Sega, around the same time I got it with the comic books. And I think I had issue one in Spider-Man Unlimited number one. So it was a, it was a cross between the two. Yeah, for those who don't know, this uh, spanned uh, Amazing Spider-Man issues 378 to 380, Spectacular Spider-Man 201 to 203, Spider-Man 35 to 37, 
Spider-Man Unlimited, number one and number two, and Web of Spider-Man, number 101 to 103. And, like, Spidey has more comics to himself when it comes to that than even Batman, because Batman was going through, at least he had, you know, Detective Comics and, and Batman himself. And oh, Spidey's got, like, everything else going on there. And I, I guess, for me, the introduction was also through the video game, knowing about it. And then, not to mention, for those who who are unaware of, like, when this was published, around what time and everything, uh, obviously it gave you the the issues of the comics that came th- uh, that came with it, but as I'm going through the credits here to kind of look at more of what happened here, I think this was put together mostly in 93, if I'm not mistaken. Just yeah, no, that's fast. Right. Yeah, so it was put together in 1993, which was, we're getting into, at that point in time, a pretty big era for, for Spider-Man, to where... It looks like the the afterword here from Demadius was added in May of 1994. So from that era of 93 to 94, Spidey was in for a pretty big boost in popularity, not just because of the video games, but also because of the animated series that was airing on Fox. That's true. And they had animated series toys, and they had the animated series video games, and they even had the animated series comic books. So they really went all out around this time to try and capitalize on Spider-Man. And not only that, but the actual comic book boom that would destroy the industry in a couple of years. But the boom was that people in the speculator market were picking up number one issues that they thought later they could sell for a bunch of money when they retired. And it turns out that that's not how that works because <laughs> <laughs> comic books, rare comic books are comic books that you can actually sell for money because they are, in fact, rare. Now, if you're selling a million issues of something, then that isn't considered rare. Everyone owns it. So there's no point in saying it's worth anything other than its face value, maybe even less. And in this case, Spider-Man Unlimited, which started the Maximum Carnage story, even today still isn't worth a lot of money. And it's been over almost 20 years. Yeah, or 30 years. So, you know, time does show that some things, some people in this industry, especially the comic book industry and at Marvel, made smart choices and some didn't. Yeah, and this entire storyline is, well, I I guess, you know, kind of an odd way. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube with a video accompaniment, you're going to be watching some uh, gameplay footage from Maximum Carnage um, as I attempt to to plow through this game. Uh, But the game and the comics share something very close in similarity in the sense of they both start off with an interesting premise and seem fun until you realize that this is getting long and boring and this is a lot harder to get through than you thought it was going to be because the game has a high difficulty level that ramps up insanely strong and this comic has a a multitude of problems like when we reviewed Batman 89 in the last episode the the movie that was something that we absolutely loved. I mean, does it have some issues? Yeah, it has some issues, but overall, is it a fantastic film? God, yes. Here, we have to try to find a way to be respectful of the work that's put into it, because obviously, comic book writers have a lot on their plates. Uh, writers and illustrators, I don't mean to like specify just one or the other. Uh, but everyone has a, a huge responsibility. Sometimes directives are handed down from corporate about what they want to see, what's supposed to happen, and in a collaborative effort, you don't have as much say as you normally would in terms of creative direction. Sometimes that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Like, uh, for instance, with Batman and No Man's Land. Great series. Again, something with issues, but Denny O'Neill was the story editor behind it, and his kind of, like, control over it helped make it a bit more cohesive than such a sprawling thing would normally be, in my opinion, at least. I agree. And then here we have a far more relaxed run than No Man's Land was, but th- there's no direction on this, Seth. There's no direction at all. <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, we will say, let's start off on a good note here, because we will say that credit give where credit is due. And as an artist, I do understand when you look at this and you do flip through the pages and you see how many characters are in each panel, whether it's superheroes or villains, and they actually have backgrounds to them, which a lot of artists didn't do at the time. You know, that's a lot of work, and that's a tremendous feat, and I think anyone who did the art on this should be proud, even though sometimes 
it doesn't always look the best. And yeah. what I mean by that, it mostly, is that some of the characters in some of the panels, they look really small and angular in peculiar ways. And while it is a Spider-Man comic book, there's just something odd about that to me. But I, I will give them credit for including a giant cast of characters. I know uh, Jim Lee has always said that one of the characters he disliked drawing so much Jim Lee, a famous artist in the comic book industry, is Spider-Man because you always have to draw the lines on him. And after Todd McFarlane left and, you know, helped start Image with uh, all the Image Boys, they had all the spaghetti webbing that the artists afterwards had to kind of follow. And if they didn't, then it looked like you were really lazy. So that, plus the lines on Spider-Man, plus the way Carnage looks, plus the way Venom looks, all the characters, plus a doppelganger Spider-Man. There's just so much work on each page. And I just can't even imagine my own self drawing it. So credit to the artist there. Yeah, and that, that's the kind of the give and take of it, where, as you say, there's a lot of character and a lot of detail. But I think there comes a, a point in time when you're trying to meet deadlines and whatnot to where when you put that much content onto it, you sacrifice the detail of that content. There are a couple of pages throughout this series where you have, you know, a full page art, just one full panel, like during a battle scene, you'll have just one full page. And when I look at those, I admire the, like the, the scope of what's contained on that page. But I look at it and think to myself, you know, if I could get a full print up of that, is that something I'd want hanging on my wall? Like, does it really hold up in that sense? And it, doesn't because of like you said the characters can look a little off and that's that's sad because there's so much potential to go on here there's a great potential to have like a beautiful shot of of spidey carnage and venom facing off against each other but it, it just doesn't quite reach the heights of where it like it could be there's a great sense of i guess you could say doing the best they can with what they got to make things work. Uh, the art never pulled me out of the story, which is sad because I think it's a case where I really wish it could have pulled me out of the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll agree with that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, again, uh, you said like splash pages, the splash pages in here are kind of off as well because, and this is kind of the technique of doing, you know, comic books is you have to kind of be on the same page with your whole team. So whether it's the colorist or the writer, whatever it is, direction has to be equal because you are all telling a story. And in some of the splash pages, and early on they look good, but later on there's just a bunch of random coloring as well. And it looks like a kid went in there and said, make this orange and this <laughs> one over here purple and throw in like some cornflower blue over here. <laughs> like it's just all over the place. So I kind of feel you on the splash pages. I will say that I think the art improves for the final issue for uh, the Spider-Man Unlimited number two that puts it into a better, a much better place. Like it ends in terms of the artwork a lot better. There's some great detail on Venom. Like you can actually see some of the veins bulging out on his arms. That's a lot better in the final issue. It's like they realize, okay, we're at the end of it. <laughs> it's just it's like, we're almost there. Let's try to salvage this thing. With a, a nice art upgrade on the on the final episode, so to say, or in this case, the final issue. But it's, it's it's too little too late for the rest of it. And I think one of the things that helps it in the end is where there's less characters. It's really at that point in time down to Spidey, Venom, and Carnage, which honestly should have been kind of more the focus of this entire thing to begin with. Yeah, I agree. The problem with this, and let's just kind of get into it a little bit. Yeah, it's a good segue. Take it away. So Carnage, uh, Maximum Carnage, <laughs> he is breaking out of Ravencroft prison, decides he wants to go on a rampage, and basically Spider-Man and Venom have to stop him, as they had previously when they took him to Ravencroft. And the big deal here is that for some reason, Carnage decides that he wants to have sort of like this family, it's so, or so it comes to be through the course of the comic books. He first meets up with Shriek in Ravencroft, who, for anyone who doesn't know, is a kind of uh, abused character as a child. Um, she was shot in the head by a cop, and she got trapped in uh, this other character, Cloak's Dark Force dimension. He kind of has a 
giant billowing cloak that he can teleport and transport people in. Her whole backstory leads her to going insane. It doesn't really paint her as a good person to begin with because she kind of was a drug dealer. Anyways, going through all of this kind of unlocked her mutant abilities to create, create and manipulate sound. So she's kind of been an on and off again resident of Ravencroft prison in the comics. And they basically lock up right at the beginning. As soon as Carnage breaks out and starts killing people left and right, they hook up and they just leave and are scouring the town for other people to kill. And immediately, and this is the weirdest part of the comic book because it just, these things just happen out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> they run into Doppelganger. And Doppelganger, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, first appeared in Infinity War and is, this is so hard to comprehend for me, but is a living geometric figure in the dimension of manifestations. And it somehow assumed the form of Spider Man. And it wasn't the only one because it was created by another villain named Magus in the same Marvel Universe, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> that Doppelganger is just running around the city and Carnage happens to run into it. And Magus, <laughs> for those who don't know, is the kind of evil alternate form of Adam Warlock. So you got that going on there, too, just making things even more strange. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you mentioned this perfectly when you say how Doppelganger just comes out of nowhere. And he does. Like, they literally find him in an alley that they just happen to be swinging across. And like, oh, well, there's a doppelganger. And somehow, some way, Shriek is just able to, to tame this thing that has almost no mind of its own. And is able to, like, add it as their, their kind of pet. Yeah, it's like their surrogate son or something. Just the, the absurdity alone of it just, like, happening to be there in the alley itself. Like... I can totally get Carnage teaming up with, with Shriek because they're right there. They're in the asylum. He's breaking out. Kind of one of those stories about somebody's breaking out. It's like, dude, take me with you. Let's both get out of here. We got a better chance together. Um, in this case, you know, that kind of kind of works. And there is something interesting about the idea that Carnage, even separated from his symbiote, the presence of it on him mutated him to the extent to where he's able to manifest something very similar to the symbiote. Not exact, but something similar. Very similar. So I I'm willing to buy that part. All that, willing to buy. But once we just uh, happen to come across Doppelganger, it's like, okay, I, you've already started to lose me here. <laughs> it is a weird opening, because I know that, you know, in the comic book mentality, you're trying to create your cast, but at least do it in a way that feels a little bit more organic rather than random meeting up of characters just in the same opening issue because you're just trying to get the story along, but you have to do it in a good way. And in this case, it just didn't feel right to me because they, they don't stop there. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. They uh, continue to add to this carnage team, the carnage circus. I think he calls it at some point or something. The next character they run into is a guy called Demogoblin. Demogoblin has a weird origin story. He was actually part of Hobgoblin, who was trying to be more powerful, and he kind of wished this from a demon name, and I've never been able to pronounce this right, Inastra? Sure, let's go with that. Yeah, who first appeared in X Factor. So the Demogoblin was partly expelled after a fight with these ghost riders. And now that the uh, mystical Demogoblin half is on a mission to find redemption for its sins, but goes about it in the worst way possible by being an extreme judge of character. So he's trying to kill heroes and basically anyone else he feels that is a sinner. But, Stefan, I don't understand. How could he be expelled by a bunch of people who write for other people under their name? <laughs> right. <laughs> How was he expelled by ghostwriters? You know... That's a good question. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, did you say ghost writers? It is ghost writers. <laughs> oh, that explains it. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, two ghost writers. Johnny Blaze, and I forget the other one's name. Maybe he just assumes the name Johnny Blaze as well, because he's a ghost writer for Ghost Rider. That sounds about right. <laughs> I think so. Somebody says, there's somebody out there who's just got, like a tomato that's just ready to throw at me and be like, stop it with the jokes, you asshole. <laughs> Why does everyone always have to bring tomatoes to a speech? 
I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. Where do they all come from? Is there just a guy who hangs out every speech, brings like a carton of tomatoes with him? He's like, come on, baby. We got a profit to make. <laughs> Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> and more seeds for tomatoes so I can keep this process going. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, the Temo Goblin just, again, just kind of shows up and somehow puts aside his quest for vengeance to kill sinners by teaming up with sinners. And, and I don't understand exactly how they got that motivational shift other than the writers want to add more villains. That's about it. Yeah. They're definitely not putting the A-listers in there, though. <laughs> no, they're not. Especially as later on, they'll also add Carrion to to the team up here. And he just literally comes up out of a sewer and fo- follows them along until he actually meets up with the group and joins them. Yeah. He is... I actually don't know too much about Carrion, but I think he's just some guy infected by a Carrion virus, and he's just called Carrion because of that. Yeah, that's basically what it is, and he's the one who plays the least valuable part in all of this. Mm -hmm. He's just kind of there. Demogoblin at least poses some sort of a challenge and a risk to people, but again, this is all just kind of hobbled together as a a family, and you, you would think that they wouldn't add that much firepower to things, but Either throughout the course of the story, they either severely weaken... Well, let me actually get to that part. Because we do have a conflict that emerges pretty quickly as Spidey finds out about the the carnage that's been happening. <laughs> oh. <laughs> when carnage slays pretty much everybody he can find at Raven at the Ravencroft Institute. It's on the news. Spidey knows that things have to happen. And he is all ready to go and jump into battle. Though Spidey's dealing with emotional issues right now. Because this takes place in a very odd part of the Spider-Man continuity, where Harry Osborn is dead, and, oh, uh, Peter Parker's parents are alive now. Mm-hmm. Which, for those who read this and, like, thought that his parents were dead, it's like, you're right. Though there was this time, very, not, not for too long, I think it was like maybe a year or two, they had a long-running storyline of where the chameleon was trying to ascertain information about Spider-Man. And knew that Peter Parker was somehow connected to him. So he created these robotic duplicates to uh, pose as the parents to Peter. And I guess Chameleon is related to Craven, the hunter. And after Craven's defeat, Chameleon wanted revenge. So he sent these robots out to pretend to be Peter's parents so that they could get information about Spider Man and bring it back to him. So we later find out. Of course, that Peter's parents have been actually dead all along, and these were robot duplicates, but he doesn't know that right now. So we got that mess going on, along with Harry Osborn being dead. So all this is going, like, affecting his mental state. But he very early on gets into a fight with the the very core group of basically Shriek, Carnage, and the Doppelganger. And they bust Spidey up pretty good, like crack his ribs. So he's he's playing hurt the entire game here, so to say. Yeah, that's true. There's a question in continuity for all of this, because not only do we have to deal with the fact that Peter's parents are around, and like you said, they're not really his parents. They actually did die because they were basically undercover spies. But not only that, now we have, and I'm just going to get this right out of the way, we have Mary Jane, who is having a weird, weird dynamic here with the whole story. Oh my god, yes. What This is, this is like the biggest... Like, what the fuck for me on this? Yeah, because she wants to, A, she wants Peter to stop being Spider-Man so much, so she's being very selfish in him saving lives. B, she's trying to, trying to come to grips with the fact that she's not sure if she even wants to be with him, so she's going out and partying, and she's even smoking cigarettes, which that was a terrible choice to add to her story. And C, she finally eventually does come to the fact that oh, I love you, and part of it is because of your responsibility towards saving lives. So it's just this weird, weird story arc for her, and uh, there's nothing else we need to say about Mary Jane, sadly. Yeah, yes, there is, sir. Yes, there are things we need to say, because I don't... <laughs> this is terrible. First, there's this awful, awful line early on where they're talking about smoking, and Peter sees her, and she's starting smoking, and uh, he's like, Mary Jane... We've already lost Harry. I don't need to lose you, too. 
and she says something like, <laughs> maybe Harry would still be alive today if he picked up cigarettes instead of being the Green Goblin. Like I said, <laughs> they never should have included that. <laughs> Even in the depths of anti-smoking public service announcements, this is one of the worst things ever written about yeah. smoking. <laughs> Maybe cigarettes could have stopped from being the Green Goblin. <laughs> Uh, we, sh- we should mention, though, they do bring Harry back, though, just because they feel like it. He's yeah. not quote-unquote dead. <laughs> no, no, but my God. Uh, that is one of the worst, again, one of the worst lines I've ever read in a comic. And then <laughs> it's so ham-fisted enough, the anti-smoking stuff. And I get it. Yeah, smoking's a problem. It's still being marketed to kids quite a bit in the 90s, so they wanted to hammer that point home. But what an awful, awful line to include. And then, like you said, her selfishness, because there'll like, be reports about, like, they'll literally be watching the news and talk about, like, dozens are dead on the streets of, of New York tonight as Carnage's rampage continues. And Spider-Man's like, I gotta go. She's like, what are you going out there for? Because there's dozens of people being dead in the streets because the news just said it, you asshole. Yeah, pretty much. She's like, but I don't want you to be Spider-Man anymore. <laughs> 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 I have not seen a character turn so bad. I'm trying to think of other mediums where I've seen something like this happen, and it is so hard to find something so comparable. This is one of the worst interpretations of a character in any form of media that I've ever seen. Yeah, I can't think of uh, can't think of one just as bad. It's really hard. And and the fact is that they keep coming back to this. This isn't just a one off like scene here because she'll be doing this the entire run of the graphic novel, or the series, mm. depending on how you put it. But she'll be doing this the entire time. There is only a part toward the end where she lightens up, but then the turn happens so fast and so cornerly that it's just, it's awful. We'll come back to that a little bit later uh, once we find out more about how the story unfolds. So, basically, after Spidey's been injured so heavily, he kind of falls down into an alley, and uh, Shriek and the, the team don't go after him like they should to try to finish him. Uh, some street punks try to, but then he's rescued by the next heroes that are going to be added to here, Cloak and Dagger. Yeah, that actual panel of Spider-Man injured with the punks around him will always live in my heart. As we've said earlier, uh, we both grew up with the video game, and that panel and some of these panels do show up in the video game. So that was always a big part of the story to me where it's like, oh, you know, I'm injured, but I got to kick these punks' ass. So I really do appreciate that they put the panels again as the 90s comics were huge they did put the panels of art into the video game it's pretty great cloak and dagger themselves i don't know what to say i they're just there (laughs) dagger herself gets uh shot by shriek not too far in a couple pages from here when they all go into their second of 500 fights (laughs) and uh she basically gets vaporized we find out later, I'm just going to say it now, that she is kind of locked into Cloak's cape and something about how their connection helped her come back and save her herself, sort of, by being trapped in there. And she doesn't Oof. lose her mind. Is that what, I, what it was? Yeah, it's, it's a really terrible way of, uh, of just trying to bring a character back to life. I mean, this is, this is even, this is right up there with... Superboy punching reality so hard that it shakes the fabric of time and brings Jason Todd back to life. Oh, I remember that. Like, this is <laughs> this is pretty much right, right up there. Yeah, that's the same alleyway, as so, you were saying. <laughs> so, so somehow, some way. And by the way, if there's ever any doubt to my, like, uh, you know, uh, comic book knowledge, there you go. I just tossed it out there. So, you know, I, I, I got, I've got knowledge about comics. <laughs> But in this case, I guess somehow Shriek's power and Dagger's power, even though it kind of vaporized her, it dispersed her into light, like the light energy itself, which then became captured within Cloak's dark dimension. And because of their love, because it's the power of love, and not the Huey Lewis, like Back to the Future power of love, which would have been a much better, you know, you have MacGuffin here. Because just imagine it, you're like you know, because you talk about the power of love and how it it tied us together and it kept the bond formed in my heart that allowed me to 
to resent, to remain in the dark dimension and piece myself back together, uh, my fractured consciousness, and then reappear. As opposed to, I heard the power of love playing on like the radio, even in the dark dimension, and I just loved that song so much that I had to come back to life. <laughs> I would, I would accept the Huey Lewis explanation better, better than this one. But yeah, that's how she somehow rematerializes. Like they, they go that the power of love thing there is just so corny. But I, I much rather it would have said that because of the connection that I have with uh, with Cloak, I was able to teleport myself into the dark dimension through our connection and just was healing myself in there. I didn't have the strength to be able to pull myself back out until now. That would have been a much better explanation. Yeah, I would have enjoyed that much more. Um, again, it's just one of the many fights, which it's hard to keep track of this. So that happens and you just left with the ability to not even see the characters react to it too much, except for Cloak, who takes off. So there's not even really time to say, oh my god, this horrible thing. You know, we need to really get Carnage now because he's just, he's gone too far and so is Shriek and blah, blah, blah. And there's none of that. It's just like, okay, on to the next thing. And they literally do, I think it's like t five, ten pages later, they get into another fight, which is one of the most questionable parts of the beginning of the story. Because as they're leaving another fight, Hobgoblin burns down, or Demogoblin, who was formerly Hobgoblin, burns down a warehouse with his fire. And in the panel, you see Spider-Man and Venom leaving to go chase after them. And in that same panel, you see that Black Cat was caught in the destruction of the warehouse. And then you go to the next page, and somehow now Venom is in the warehouse on fire in the destruction of it, even though the panel before he was webbing away with Spider-Man. It makes no sense whatsoever. And this is a crossover between issues that this happens. So I'm guessing that the writers and the artists didn't talk to each other. Again, going back to, if you're going to do a big thing like this, you have to communicate something. Yeah. I, I guess tension building between the relationship between Black Cat and Spidey. And this is one of the, I guess one of the major themes of the story is that we're going to have these discussions that happen on a constant basis. A actually, let me back up here because there's going to be several constant conversations that are going to be happening through this story that make it so repetitive. First, mm -hmm. we're going to have the constant Mary Jane badgering him about being Spider-Man and her selfishness. That's always going to be a presence in here. Two, there's always going to be some sort of a conversation about how much Carnage and Shriek just love killing things. It, it just does not stop. And I understand that they want to have, like, a one-note kind of villain and villainous team up here about how they just want to kill. Which, in a way, could be effective if they stopped fucking talking about it so much. Because there's... Right. we Why are they repeating themselves so much? We already know. They already know what they're doing. Why are they continuing to talk about it? Just make some bad puns and then just, you know, keep moving forward. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the potential that they could have had for kind of like a parallel to um, Starkweather and his child, like, you know, child bride, so to say. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Charles Starkweather was an infamous serial killer who took a young woman along with him for this kind of like serial killing joyride. And you could have had something very similar to that with this dynamic here, which could have been legitimately creepy. But it, 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 it's hard for it to be creepy when the dialogue is so bad, just so mm -hmm. poorly written. And then if there's another conversation to be had with all of this, it's the third one about how Spidey is going to be having this constant moral confliction over whether or not they should try to kill Carnage or stop him by, quote, any means necessary, which could mean killing him. And that is going to come up an awful lot, too, which also just makes things ugh, frustrating. Yeah, the only good thing that I kind of cracked up over, <laughs> and this happens a lot because uh, Demogoblin and Carnage aren't really playing for the same team. Again, he just went along with them thinking he was going to quote unquote cleanse the sinners. And they start to have a little tiff here and there because Carnage is doing things that, you know, he doesn't Demogoblin doesn't agree with. And one of the things Carnage says, he says, listen to me, you refugee from a pumpkin patch. <laughs> <laughs> and listen good, because I'm only going to say this once. I don't know why, but he called him a refugee from a pumpkin patch and I can I only think of that one old rock and roll song. I think you know which one I'm talking about. But it cracked me up. Um, there are a couple good one-liners, but for the most part, they're just sitting there 
calling each other sweet cakes and sweet murder and everyone die and I am carnage. It's just the same thing over and over again. And sadly, Doppelganger is so confused. (laughs) (laughs) He's just like, I don't know what I'm doing. Mom, dad, stop fighting. (laughs) Oh, on top of all this, too, we also get this. This is an odd recurring theme where people are going to start pulling powers and abilities out of their ass that we've never seen before or have no explanation. Like, for example, oh, my, this is possibly the funniest and unintentionally funny scene in the entire run of the comic, where during a fight between Spidey and Demogoblin, Demo is going to throw a a bomb at Spidey that is apparently just a bomb full of sadness. I, I don't know how else to explain it, but it's just a bomb full of sadness. Or as, um, I, I guess as Spidey says here, it's releasing some sort of living darkness. Moving too fast. C- can't dodge in time. I feel so cold. What's happening to me? And then, as it's being explained, he says, That was no ordinary bomb, Spider-Man. It was meant to give you a taste of what all sinners must eventually face. The despair and unending hopelessness of eternal torment. And then from behind him is a priest. Because, <laughs> of course, there's a priest who just shows up. <laughs> <laughs> blasphemous trickster release him by all that's holy and then Spidey as Demogobble punches him Spidey says priest tried to help I can't let Demogobble hurt him have to fight against the darkness fight it with truth the truth that no matter how I feel as long as I breathe there <laughs> is hope and he punches him punches Demogobble and goes up to the priest and says you alright that I am Spider-Man thanks to you no father Thanks to you. <laughs> just... uh... <laughs> oh, that would have been great if they just added another page of them just going back and forth. No, you. No, you. No, you. <laughs> Do you remember that Justice League episode that takes place in like um, that kid's fictional world? And he keeps trying to distract them with emergencies so they don't find out the true cause of what's going on in that world. And then suddenly, like, oh, my God, there's a bus full of nuns heading right towards that TNT truck. Oh, God, I can't remember. It's something like that. And the Flash has to, like, save save the bus full of nuns. And in this (laughs) case, it felt so similar. Just something pulled straight out of their ass. Just like, let's throw a priest in there just to ratchet up the tension. (laughs) It really does feel like that, though. Again... Just everything that happens, they they soon introduce Mo- uh, Mobius, the living vampire. He just shows up out of nowhere. People start destroying property. They go to a nightclub, and now Mobius is fighting with them on their side. The nightclub is called The Deep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the thing is, is like most of these fights that happen, Carnage has the upper hand. He always almost wins. And for some reason, he just takes off. He's like, ah, we're done here. Let's go. Demogoblin, throw some bombs. We're out of here. That is literally, I want to say, eight out of ten fights. Am I, am I incorrect, Webb, or is that about how it goes? No, I mean, that, that's totally right. There's, there's always some sort of excuse for why they have to run off. And here's the thing that I really don't get, because eventually we're going to get to the point where Spider-Man realizes, uh, we, we need to get some extra help in here. And he eventually... God, some of the help is even called for. Some of it just fucking shows up. Um, like yeah. Out of nowhere, again, being ridiculous. <laughs> so I don't get it. But at some point in time, they realize, oh, look, it's a symbiote. We need to try to fight it using what symbiotes are weak against. Like, yes, you do. Why did you do this from the very goddamn start? Right. So eventually they, they recruit Firestar, who... Oh, by the way, we should mention, one of the reasons why they don't pull in more help here to begin with is that they, they mention, like, the Fantastic Four are off on vacation somewhere, and the Avengers are all fighting something else. And so they, they can't call in that kind of support that they would normally have for something like this. So instead, they just have to resort to, like, discount heroes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I hope that the video maybe matches up with this, too. But when they do go to the Fantastic Four, the Baxter building... Actually, I don't think it's called the Baxter Building in this comic book. But anyway, they go there and they dismantle all the security to get the Sonic gun that Reed Richards built that takes care of symbiotes, apparently, because of the noise. And 
they disable all the security and the uh, robots and everything. And if you're watching the gameplay from the video game, this level was just brutal. Very brutal. <laughs> it was. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's how far I got back in my old days of playing it over and over again. But yeah, they go there and they get it and they try to use it on Carnage, who we find out part of the reason is, and this comes to the end too in the conclusion, but part of the reason the way he is is because he had a very bad childhood growing up. He was bullied, he was abused, he was an orphan, all sorts of things that he is trying to bury deep with inside of him, and he's letting loose, killing people by burying all that in him and becoming more inhuman and letting the symbiote prey on his basic needs of revenge against the world. But I, I would I want to see an issue of a comic that takes place after this where it's Reed Richard coming home to the building after they get back from their trip, and he's looking around, like, what the hell happened to my security? <laughs> Just looks at Ben. Ben? Was it me? <laughs> yeah. And then, like, they find a note from Spider-Man. Hey, Reed, sorry I had to destroy everything that you own. Just need to borrow that Sonic gun. Catch you later. <laughs> it's clobbering time. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lawsuit where Spider-Man has to pay for all the damages Obviously, Daredevil represents him in court. It's like, Your Honor, my client had a pressing need to be able to obtain that Sonic gun at this time. And obviously, those needs, if the government had done it and the police were doing it, we wouldn't be in this situation. They have immunity. They have qualified immunity. But Spider-Man, who's trying to save the world from carnage, doesn't? Give me a break. What's the deal? (laughs) Now, I may be a blind lawyer, but even I can see the need for this gun at this time, Your Honor. Spider-Man. Innocent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And clearly he gets off and the civil suit's thrown out and Reed just has to, like, you know, make a bunch more stuff, but he's very bitter and hateful and just, like, locked away in his lab and Sue comes to check out. He's like, don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> I want a divorce. <laughs> exactly. And that's that would have been a much better story than what we have here. <laughs> it's true. I, I always want to call him Death Clock just because of the band. <laughs> <laughs> For the sake of purpose, from now on, we are going to refer to Deathlock as Deathclock. Yeah, De- Deathclock shows up, <laughs> uh, gets his ass handed to him, and then Iron Fist shows up <laughs> to save a <laughs> ass handed Deathclock. <laughs> <laughs> now, mind you, the whole Death Deathclock is stuck in like a neon sign to where he's constantly being too overloaded with current. To be able to stop it. And there's no circuit breaker that, like, trips because of this, apparently. Like, nope. Right. Nothing like that. <laughs> He's just stuck up there. And there's, like, this, like, you know, electrician. <laughs> just like, you know, John the electrician. It's just like, yeah, that's like, got a problem here. I mean, I can't, like, you know, turn it off because the, the arcing of the electricity is everywhere. And, you know, <laughs> can't, like, shut down the grid. So I don't know what we're going to do. You're just kind of stuck there. And then Iron Fist just punches through the sign. Because, of course, he does. That's how he solves everything. Mm-hmm. And she's like, Iron Fist, just solve your problem, electrician. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, they don't want to uh, turn off the power grid again for the Ghostbusters. They already know what happened in 1984, <laughs> so they don't want to repeat of that. Uh, no stay puffed in this story. Yeah, so they add, basically, to the legion of superheroes they're building here to fight Carnage. And Mobius or Morbius, I should say, uh, he goes to sleep because the sun is up. So he's out of commission for a second. <laughs> but basically, they all get into another fight. The one thing we do learn is that Shriek and Carnage on their Havoc spree are creating the people of the city to start to go mad. Yes. And we learn later that Shriek is basically the one causing this by a psychic channel she has with people's inner psyche. It, that's I'll give it credit. That was kind of cool. I do like the idea of her being able to do that, although it'd be weird that they would continue to do it while she's not around, which is something they do do, which doesn't make any sense. No, it really doesn't. It, having her be some sort of a, a conduit uh, like that it is interesting, and it certainly does ratchet up some of the tension that happens in here, knowing that New York City is going mad because of it. But they, they kind of handle it as a just again like kind of pulling it out of nowhere Mm -hmm. it would be i don't know somehow it could have been handled a bit better in terms of like maybe having it a more subtle build up to the reveal of it 
because uh, they kind of just like you know fall onto it so quickly, and even Shriek just like they kind of like she explains things at one point in time. They say she's talking about it, and she's like, "Look at me talking about it like I'm some villain in a comic book." It's because yeah, you are, and that was their way of giving exposition, and then trying to hand wave it. And nobody would go into the detail that she's talking about things the way that she is in a comic right. book or not. It's just so fucking forced. And and that's a huge problem when it comes into the the middle stages of this comic is that so much of it seems forced. The only thing that comes out kind of naturally, and this is probably the best scene in the entire comic, is when Spidey is like in despair, not knowing what they're going to do to try to stop this, and Captain America shows up and mm-hmm. comes in. It's like need a hand, son. Looks like you could use one. And it's like yeah. thank God Cap is here. Like amazing. Oh man, I love Cap. Right before that though, the the one cool little note that they do find out, it's almost like their own, the one piece of investigating that they do as a team <laughs> <laughs> is that when they brought Firestarter with them um, and they had the Sonic gun, they were using them both on Carnage at the same time. Yes. A- and they realized that Firestarter is the only one damaging him. The Sonic gun has little to no effect on this new symbiote, which if anyone doesn't know, Carnage is basically the baby to Venom. So Firestarter has to basically make a moral decision. Does she kill uh, Cletus Cassidy, a.k.a. Carnage, or does she just immobilize him enough to where they can maybe do something and capture him some way? I, I do have to jump into this uh, mild correction. Firestarter is the name of a Stephen King novel. Firestar is the name of our uh, female uh, protagonist here. There we go. Sorry. Though I would like that crossover. I mean, yeah. We're already throwing in so many other characters. Why don't we just throw in, you know, uh, Drew Barrymore from Firestarter. Let's uh, put Pennywise in here. Jack Torrance from The Shining. Let's just throw them all in here right now. Hmm. Jack Torrance would fit in with the crowds, that's for sure. He, he totally would fit right in. He and, uh, and Carnage, they'd get along famously. <laughs> yeah, so there's this uh, nice little grid panel where <laughs> Spider-Man tells Firestar, you know, uh, you know what, go ahead and kill him. And Venom's like, yeah, baby, do it. Yeah, cook him. Yeah. And Firestar's, Spider-Man's like, Firestar, wait. Never mind. I was wrong. And Venom's like, what? <laughs> you were so close. <laughs> you were just about to end them. What? And then they start fighting with each other, allowing Carnage and Shriek to escape. Now, here, here's a question uh, to break up the flow of discussing this awful story. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find in this situation an endearing or frustrating about Spider-Man that they that he doesn't resort to killing Carnage. Um, I think in the way it's written, it's frustrating. But the fact that I think mostly frustrating because at first he says, "Yeah, kill him." I don't think Spider-Man would ever say that. I just don't see that happening. They try to cover that up with uh, the side story, the the not real. Um, <laughs> Uh, Parker, his dad's name, I forget his dad's name. Richard. Richard Parker is telling him that, you know, sometimes you have to, like, be the bad guy and, you know, take the hard road, and that didn't work for me. None of this works for me, so it's frustrating more than anything. See, I I keep coming around to the idea that, you know, Batman and Superman refusing not to kill, and how that sets a very strong moral line for them, and I don't like seeing it be violated. Here's a case where Carnage is just obviously completely irredeemable, and something has to be done to to kill this guy, in my opinion. And Spidey refuses to take that that line. And I can understand if he cannot give the order to kill somebody, or if he can't do it himself. But if that's the case, just let Venom do it. Just <laughs> please, just let him do it. He obviously, clearly wants to. Yeah, <laughs> he, he wants this bad. <laughs> like he wants it more than you do, and. Don't stop him, at least. Let Venom do it. I mean, yes, you have the power to stop him. Yeah, you do, but this is one case where if you turn your back the other way, it's going to be okay. It's actually going to save a lot of people's lives if you just turn your back on this one a little bit, Spidey, just a little bit. That is kind of, yeah, that's kind of the running gag, though, in this book, is that for as intelligent as Spider-Man is, they don't even try to do anything that could actually stop Carnage to about halfway through the book. And then when they do figure it out, he doesn't have the guts to say, yeah, kill him. So, What I also don't understand is if they know fire is like the one weakness, 
why don't they try to do that more? Or mm. why don't they like, you know, why doesn't Spidey go, you know what? I know the Avengers are out of town and I know we can't get Human Torch, but what if like, you know, we get this Doctor Strange around, the Flames of the Fultine might help. <laughs> do we, you know, do, is War Machine available? He can't be on the same mission as Iron Man, surely. And I'm sure War Machine can get like a, like, uh, I got a heat ray or something on there. You even get the goddamn Punisher with a flamethrower. Like, it's somebody in here who has fire. Why don't they do that? Yeah, that raises a few questions. First off, this is New York. So, I mean, they're bound to run into one of those other people just crossing the city, right? I mean, Carnage <laughs> ran into doppelganger so easy. Secondly, you know, I, w- I would like to look at the other comic books, the, the Avengers and everyone else, and see if they actually weren't at where they said they were because if they were then that means they just didn't answer the phone and that's messed up avengers <laughs> it's just really messed up especially when it's national news that we're hearing about in the tv surely one of them could have heard about this yeah so I'd, I'd like to look at that maybe look at an avengers comic as this was going on and be like no you guys just you guys just ignored that phone in the background right there jarvis could have called up tony and been like sir there's a problem here in new york <laughs> go ahead jarvis <laughs> you take it. You got the flamethrower? Yes, sir. All right. Come join Spidey. Help him out. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> getting back to the story, when they make the moral, you know, moral call and the compass finds its right mark and they don't kill Carnage, he just kind of comes back and Shriek is so pissed off at Venom and Venom is so pissed off at them that she actually pretty much takes the symbiote off of Eddie Brock. Yeah. And they. this is one of the only few dark moments in the comic book where her and uh, Carnage literally lay into him. They beat the ever-loving crap out of him, and then they say, no, we're not going to kill you right now, and they take off with Venom. And then this is where we finally get into what I call the third act, where all the superheroes finally get together. Captain America, uh, everyone's there. Yeah, and then they they have to go about trying to like fix the city because they know that people are being thrown into disarray, and they, they try to tame the crowd at different points with, like, Death Clock showing up and say, like, hey, kid, you stealing the computer? It's like, yeah. It's got, like, 80 megabytes of hard drive space. And he's <laughs> like, kid, don't steal computers. <laughs> and the kid's like, you're right. I shouldn't steal this computer. Oh, by the way, you're Death Clock. I hear you can, like, go into cyberspace. And it's like, just kid, put down the fucking computer, Okay. <laughs> and then Spider-Man like stops a woman from dropping her babies off the ledge of a building because she's like, oh my god, my baby dresses up as you, so I don't want to drop him off the side of the, the building now. And it's like, yeah, you, you probably shouldn't drop your babies off the side of the building. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's getting out of hand. <laughs> the, the, but the thing is, the only one redeeming thought or page on that one is just where there's a couple of people who are trying to commit a crime. They're doing something. They're fighting or whatnot. And then Captain America shows up behind them, and they see his reflection in, like, the glass of uh, the building that they're trying to break into or something. And they turn around, and they just immediately regret what they're doing because it's Captain America standing right there. And that yeah. is the one believable moment that I would have in that sequence there, where just the sight of Captain America and what he represents would be enough to say, yeah, uh, I- I'm-, I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, that, that part actually gave me chills because... Captain America is basically like Superman. He's supposed to represent the best in all of us. And I think if if I had been under Shriek's control and I saw Cap, I'd probably have that same reaction. It's a great scene. It really is. And Cap was one of those heroes that when, when I was growing up, I thought just the idea of Captain America was so corny. But then as I actually got to like find out more about Cap and actually like read about him, it, it just... There's something so so awesome about it here. The the sequence here is like this guy who's just so filled with hate. He's like, hate these windows, like looking in the mirror, showing me what a failure I am. I'll break them all. He's going to break this building, uh, this window. And then there's Cap behind him. And he's just looking at him. And there's no dialogue except when Cap's just like looking at him. And the guy just says, I, I'm sorry. And he drops the brick. Yeah. It is a beautiful sequence, possibly the best sequence in the entire comic. And it just goes to show something here that's so effective about it is that Cap doesn't have to say a goddamn thing. He doesn't say a word. And there's so many other sequences in this book where if the characters just didn't say anything, they'd be more effective. Like, Cloak spends all this time bemoaning the fact that Dagger is dead. 
and totally get that, understand it while he's sad about it. But why not have him be silent in his grief and anger? Because that would make him even edgier. And, like, it would show just how dark he's become that he doesn't even have words to discuss things. It would work so much more effectively if they just didn't have him talk. And even with a lot of things that Spider-Man says would be so much more effective if he didn't talk. Or Mary Jane being moody. Don't have her talk. Just show her being cold and don't explain away, like, the selfishness. Just have it be her saying, I'm sorry, Peter, I can't handle this. I know you have to do what you have to do. But at the same time, I worry about you so much. I don't want to lose you. I, I can't I can't talk to you right now. And that would have right. worked so much better. It would have. This is a very dialogue-heavy book, we should say, as well. I'm pretty sure that every single panel, and even flipping through it right now, every single panel has some sort of word bubble, whether it's inner thoughts whether it's explaining the scene or someone having a conversation with somebody else, every single panel has something on it. And you just need more quiet moments in a comic book sometimes. This one has none of that. Especially when, after taking off with Venom, they torture him. And, you know, instead of just having this, like, terrible scene of Eddie, you know, yelling out in pain and terror, you know, they're just talking the whole time and it kind of ruins the whole bit, you know? The Carnage kids as well? I mean, Doppelgangers, he doesn't have a single lick of dialogue, I don't think, other than, yeah, than, like, yelling or something. But just have something more with him in a fight where he, he, obviously, he doesn't talk, so just don't let the hero talk either. Just have a fight. (laughs) Something. And then even so, the dialogue, you're like, at some point in time, Morbius and, oh, by the way, Nightwatch shows up too, because why not? But there's one point in time where Morbius and Nightwatch go into the Statue of Liberty where... Venom is being held, and the dialogue is, Nightwatch comes in, it seems we've chased the monsters to their lair, Morbius. Now we can destroy them all at once, Nightwatch. Why are you calling each other by fucking name in the middle of a, a, of a fight? You know who <laughs> each other are. Why are you calling each other by fucking name? Seriously. Is it so, is so, is it so Carnage can know who they are? Like, who are you talking to? <laughs> yeah, and this, speaking of Carnage, this is kind of where the end of the story unfolds, and, um... Going back to the power dynamic of what they were calling the Carnage family, but Eddie even calls them the Carnage kids at some point, they start to kind of break up. Shriek wants to, is starting to lose it and kind of going on her own little thing. She's out in the middle of the crowds and rallying them together. And, you know, Captain America shows up and he's like, you know, that's not going to work anymore. I'm here. And Venom escapes. And they're all just kind of falling apart here. Uh, The bad guys aren't losing specifically because of any reason. They weren't losing because of any specific reason at the beginning either. They would just take off in the middle of a battle, even if they were winning. So that continues to happen until the end of the story, basically. Yeah, and then we do get one interesting moment of how dark things get as they're starting to fracture and Carnage, to prove a point about his power and his control over the group, kills Doppelganger. Just mm-hmm. straight up impales him, which is something that could have been done a bit earlier to add some tension to how, like, chaotic Carnage is. That would have been great, but they they don't pull, pull that out until later. And yeah, it kind of brings things back together in the sense of, like, he's ruling a bit more by fear now. But then we get to, like, oh, God. We get to, like, <laughs> the, the pivotal moment of the battle to where the tide is turned. Ugh. This is painful. This is painful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, throughout this comic, Aunt May had said something to Peter about, you know, you can find the answer if you just look inside your heart. And somehow, finally, in the middle of everything, that somehow makes Peter realize, of course, I know what we need to do. And apparently what that translated into was that they needed to make a gun that could fire positive energy out of it. Like, not... Now, like, by positive energy, I don't mean, like, you know, how current electricity flows from a positive end to a negative end. It's not an electric gun. It's more, if you took the pink slime from Ghostbusters <laughs> 2, from Ghostbusters 2 that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you just put it in a gun and turn it into energy instead of goo, and you just blast people with it. That's what they did. And the thing that's so ridiculous about this is, first of all, nothing Aunt May said could ever tr- translate into... Like, oh, Peter, what you just need to do is you need to make a gun, but instead of bullets, 
have it fire love bullets. Uh, <laughs> I mean, at that point, they're basically <laughs> Care Bears. They just shoot the love out of their chest. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> and the hesitant is so ridiculous about it. <laughs> all of the all of the heroes are there at one time, and then like they all fucking leave except for Spider Man. And he's and Spider Man's just like facing vet, uh, facing down Carnage for like five minutes. And apparently, in that five minute span, they were able to build and equip Death Clock with that gun that they just come back up with and start shooting people with it. Right, and this is after Dagger comes back to life and has the same ability. <laughs> To cause positive energy in the bad guys. She has the same ability, but for some reason they still go build a gun in five minutes and use that instead. And then of the ridiculous thing that this gun can do, not only can it like start to have carnage like build up positive energy inside of himself and remember like what should have been the good times, you know, <laughs> the the love of humanity. Uh, mm-hmm. but it also makes Shriek start to like turn partially good and Somehow, some way, it cures the carrion virus and turns carrion back into a normal boy. Yeah, he's no longer uh, Pinocchio. I mean, carrion. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, apparently, love can just you know conquer viruses too. Who'd have Who'd have thought? Yeah. To its credit, though, when they do use this gun, it is cool to see Shriek. You know, say you know, Carnage. It won't hurt if you stop struggling against it. Basically, there is redemption for us. Just give in. And Carnage is just will not. He does not care. He, he does not want to give in. And they find this body on the floor that looks like Carnage. <laughs> the symbiote thankfully covering up all the bits we don't need to see. <laughs> the Venom and Spider-Man are at the park just chilling, talking it out, saying, you know, hello, hi, how's it going? <laughs> I'm all right. And then Carnage just comes out of the lake and he's still alive. <laughs> It apparently wasn't Carnage. Carnage put a fake symbiote on a human being in the middle of the chaos. Now, Stefan, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What was Carnage doing in the lake? Because, obviously, if Spider-Man is just hanging out in Central Park, he would have seen Carnage go into the lake. Because he's there, (laughs) and his spider sense would have told him something. Right. So that means that Carnage had to have got there before Spider-Man did. So, was he just like, I'm just going to chill here in the lake for a while, because... Yeah, eventually Spider-Man's going to show up here. I know it. He's just got to come to this one little pond. I know he's got to be here. So I'm just going to chill here underwater for a while. Like, is that that what he was thinking? I think, you know, it's just, you know, after you superhero really hard and you villain really hard, you need a drink of water here and there. Just got real thirsty. It's like, ah, Central Park Lake. Mm. <laughs> you make it sound like a like a light beer commercial. Yeah, in case you are uh, creating too much carnage, Colt 45. <laughs> <laughs> right here in Central Park Pond. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Billy D. Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up and finish this bastard off. <laughs> Seriously, this is the end of it. Um, <laughs> the ridiculous end. Uh, do you want to say what happens, Web? <laughs> I mean, they get carnage to, uh, like, Oh, God, it, it, he goes back and like they, they span this fight spans like three different areas. I mean, we start off in the park and then we go back to like uh, Carnage's home or some shit. And they visit a prison. They basically do a tour of things. I don't understand why they went to all these places. Um, no, the, pr- the prison thing, I think, happened a bit before that. Yeah, because I think they go from the park to Cletus Cassidy's like childhood home. Um, no, no, wait, they, no, they do go to a prison first. They do go to the prison. Yeah, and then in the middle of this, okay, so they go from the park to the prison, and in the middle of between the prison and Cassidy's home, Spider-Man goes to a hospital and gets his ribs fixed. He has surgery. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and, like, they're bandaged. Um, and even Mary Jane's like, I, don't, I didn't think that they bandaged ribs anymore. And he's like, well, I, I asked them to because uh, I need a lot of extra support because uh, I got to go finish off Carnage. Assuming Venom hasn't killed him by now, because I just stopped caring about whether or not that was going to happen. Yeah, he literally leaves just to go get fixed. And, and, and he even has like this whole thing with Mary Jane, where her character comes full circle and says, Ah, never mind, I'm not really that mad at you. <laughs> yes. And, and they, they have the last battle, which is just could have happened in the first issue. Literally, the same exact thing. <laughs> yeah, and all that really happens is that they... 
they get knocked. Uh, Venom basically knocks Carnage out of um, his childhood home where he's being tormented by his past demons. And they realize that Carnage's sanity is slipping more and more for a while. Carnage is trying to dig up the body of his dead mother, um, which is also a little strange. And actually mm. starting to add some like unique qualities to his character at this point. Yeah. Because once, once a character starts digging up dead bodies, you know shit's gotten real. But then somehow Venom senses that Carnage is like starting to piece himself back together. So he decides to tackle him and tackle him into the area of a power generator. And I guess the the liquid symbiote doesn't mesh well with the electricity of the power generator. And it all explodes. And like somehow Carnage still survives it. They see his body. They pick him up. And then Venom is just like, you know, off somewhere else. Like, good thing we avoided that explosion. It hurt a little bit. It's going to take time to recover. But thank God we're not dead. And then he takes off. And then the Avengers show up fi- finally. Like, Vision's there. It's like, what we miss? <laughs> <laughs> we were getting burritos at Taco Bell. What happened? <laughs> How many people are dead in New York City? Oh, fuck! Why, why didn't you call us sooner? We were we were doing anything. We were just hanging around. <laughs> and then Thor is there for like a split second, and it's like looking at Carnage's body and all that stuff. And they they haul him off in a Quinjet. And Spider Man's like, "Oh, be careful with him." It's like we know we're not you. We we know we got protectionary measures. We'll put him like a protective tube or something, and then they take off. Yeah, the goop tube. And basically, Spider-Man just says, you know, uh, most monsters stay dead forever. Ghosts can't hurt you, I hope. And we get to see Norman Osborn and Harry Osborn's grave, because that's where this all took place when he was trying to dig up his mom, Carnage was. Um, I will say that gleaming, the gleaming end there with Carnage really losing it and digging up his mom and... You know, all the swirling, like, shadows of the people who have heard him in his past life. That was the best part of his character. It wasn't the chaos or the madness or killing people. It was that part. That was unique. But yeah, I mean, I can understand the desire to have a character just be purely evil. That evil generally has to come from something. Now, maybe people are just born evil, and if they don't get the nurturing that they need, they they embrace those inner negativity and all that stuff. Maybe that there's something like, you know, philosophical about that. But there, we always have a past. Everybody has a past. And bringing that up to show, like, some of the conflict that can happen in a person's mind is often necessary for these characters. Or at least one of the things that we talked about before with, with Batman 89 was how sometimes things don't need to be explained. And there's certain things that can happen off camera that are really interesting that we don't need to see because it, it would over explain it. And this is something that kind of happens here in two odd ways. When Carnage is just constantly explaining how they just like killing things, 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 they just like killing things. We get it. You like killing things. So we don't need to hear about it anymore. Just let the madness continue. Or even if they didn't say anything from the beginning, just like, you know, Spider Man like confronts him at the end, it's like, why Carnage? Why all of this? And you just kind of look back at him because it's, like, it's so much fun to kill. Mm-hmm. Like, that would have been so much more effective and creepier instead of, like, having him discuss the motivations all the time. That's all you had to do. That's all you had to do. And then the things that they don't explain, like, how do you make the love gun? How do they do it? Like, that's one of those things that kind of needs <laughs> to be explained. <laughs> like, the, they don't explain that, but they over-explain the motivation of Carnage to death. You know, and like I said in the Batman episode, too, you know, some things don't need to be explained. Like, how did the Ghostbusters get their proton packs? They just show up with them. Right. But you, but it is given that they're scientists. They're going to study this. They're going to they've worked on equipment before, you know, so there's something already there for you to grasp onto. And this there's just nothing. I should also point out, too, that there's I, I'm not sure if they took anything from this, but Carnage does through this whole thing kind of rule in a gang mentality type way where he you know like if anyone saw Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles you know Shredder he's like we're a family you know and it's it's kind of like that but he rolls through fear Mm -hmm. as opposed to actual love so I'm not sure if that was something they wanted to do on purpose if they just saw turtles and were like hey we could figure that out (laughs) but that was maybe one of the little like subtle things that kind of happened between the uh, gang of villains here. 
Well, I would have loved to see the rule by fear happen a bit earlier than what it did when they killed off Doppelganger. Like, they could have killed him off a lot earlier than what they did, and it could have been helpful. What, one of the things that I don't get, though, I mean, obviously we know Spider-Man is injured throughout all of this, so he's less effective. But I find it hard to believe that the team-up that they had going, even if it was just Black Cat, Cloak, Venom. Death, death Clock. <laughs> <laughs> Throw Death Clock in there. But that team of villains should have easily been able to handle, like, Carnage and Shriek. Yeah, I, I, I have a hard time believing that the, the good guys had that much of a problem. Especially when, in one of the conflicts... Cap literally takes out Shriek with one shield throw. Just, like, hits her in the back with a shield, boom, unconscious. And then they tie her up with webbing, like, at a street yeah. post. That was the most idiotic thing you could have done, because obviously she's eventually going to be able to break out of that. Why didn't you just, like, take her with you and, like, put her someplace where, like, you know you could keep an eye on her so they couldn't get her back? Yeah, just uh, sedate her, even, in some way, you know? Do something. Just something, yeah. Or, like, throw her in the dark dimension for a while again, like Cloak. Just keep her there. Though, I, I guess at that point in time, Cloak had, like, dropped out of the action for a while because he was still in mourning. Yeah, so, oh, whatever. Dagger. Mm -hmm. But there's just so many decisions that were made in this that are terrible decisions. If they had taken this from, uh, what is this, 14 parts or 12 parts? I think it's 14. I it's think ridiculous. You're right. It's yeah. a 14 part series. It easily could have been half that. And if it had been half that, it would have been so much more effective as a story in terms of, like, not repeating plot beats time after time. Yet 14 issues. So you could have have that condense the story. You didn't have to put so many characters in there that just felt ancillary and underused. And, and you could have salvaged this with a couple of, like, creative decision changes and not such hackneyed, on-the-nose writing. I, th this is one of the most poorly written comics of this era that I have ever read in terms of straight up dialogue just being terrible and going back to the 90s you know people give the 90s not enough credit for the good things that it does do like maximum carnage is not one of them but the reason why this was created and following afterwards the clone saga the reason those things were a thing at all is because of batman nightfall and death of superman and if you go look at those things you'll see that they're either the same length or they were shorter, but they were done way better. Way, way better. Way better. And this is uh, this is weird because usually people are like, well, Marvel does it better because of blah, blah, blah. And for one of these, one of those times, DC actually, you know, fared, fared well. So uh, like uh, Webb said, you know, this is bloated. Um, the dialogue's bad. There were um, some glimmers some real good glimmers of what could have been a great comic book. So I don't I don't actually hate it. I don't know about you, Webb, but I don't actually hate this comic book. I just think it was a missed opportunity, and it, it's hard to read a missed opportunity for 14 issues. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, God. On this show, when we're, we're, when we're doing this podcast, we really want to avoid a word like hate because good, hardworking people put their time and their energy into making this. Mm -hmm. And to say that you hate their work, kind of like despair, to me, it feels like it would be disparaging them as individuals. And we're not about that. You and I are definitely not about that because we want to see people succeed. We don't like to hate things. I want to go into this comic the first time I read it and I want to enjoy it. Um, I'd heard some negative things about it, but I wanted to try to enjoy it. Do I enjoy it? Not at all. Um, there's definitely room for improvement. Like I said, just small things like not having the characters talk so much. Um, having Saving Carnage's explanation for why he was doing this uh, and why he went through it all. Save it for the end and just like have him say in just that one line, because killing is so much fun. Just like save it for there. Don't have Mary Jane constantly being so selfish. Just have her being closed off and cold and have Peter try to figure it out later. Because even then, like, it would have made her seem less selfish if she didn't talk about it. Obviously, it was just something bothering her. But, you know, just have her be cold and standoffish and let Peter wonder what's going on. And that would have created the same stress in him that they were trying to uh, achieve. But it would have been done in a far more believable way. Him not knowing what Mary Jane's problem would are would create just as much stress as 
like him having a confrontation with her. So small changes like that could have made this so much better. And those aren't hard choices to make. Those aren't hard things to incorporate. So I don't understand why that wasn't done. And I guess that's ultimately the problem I have with something like this. Like you said, with a missed opportunity. When the difference between something being done poorly and a missed opportunity is that with a missed opportunity, there are there are conscious decisions that could have been made that could have changed things. And then you have to wonder, why weren't those decisions done? And that's what I would love to know about this. Why weren't simple things done that really could have saved this? Why didn't somebody look at that dialogue and go, this is way too on the nose and it's way too constant? There's so much script here. Why aren't you cutting this to condense it? What happened? Why didn't that those decisions be made? The dialogue in here, like I said, is so on the nose, it reads like a comic from the goddamn 60s where that was epidemic of on-the-nose writing. Mm-hmm. And th- but this is the 90s. There was no excuse for this. And even then, with the, like, the attitude era of like this, the dark edginess of the 90s, again, uh, the lack of dialogue and having characters just being dark and brooding about things could have worked so much better. So to me, it's, it's not something that I, I hate. It's something that I find baffling in the creative choices. And, and that's what really gets to me. I agree. But on... On a positive note, though, because it's it's really hard to tear down people's work, especially when, like we we've said already, there was there was so much put into this. The positive side is that we did get some kind of neat games. Uh, <laughs> in in the future, we would get some kind of neat Venom and Carnage stories, and uh, Venom would get his own mini series, and you know now they have uh, Absolute Carnage out and everything, so. If if anything, it led to greater things in the future. And, you know, you can always go back and look at even uh, Spider-Man's first stories, and you're not going to think those are the greatest Spider-Man stories, I'm sure. But it always leads to greater and better things, and this comic certainly helped pave the way for those to come. And, you know, now you can go into a comic shop today and say, hey, Absolute Carnage is pretty great. So do that <laughs> instead of reading this. <laughs> and you know that that I will say too, the emblematic cover art that was used on the games and is used on the the front of the graphic novel of Carnage just basically flying over New York City uh, with everything blood red. I do like that. Oh yeah, I had that red cartridge too. I think I think there was a commercial too that was like thirty seconds long. It was basically just that. It was like people looking up in New York and there was Carnage going ah. When I look at it, I start thinking in my head. I start hearing doom do do. My baby told me once. My baby told me twice. My baby told me three times. Three times, nice. Baby, it's magic. Magic. Yeah, just for those who don't know, it's the song from Ghostbusters when they start releasing all the energy from the containment unit. Which, by the way, one of the best matches of music and cinema, in my opinion, in film history. Yeah, sorry I messed that up. He just goes, please. Please, baby, it's magic. Magic. It's, it's creepy, and if, if you ever hear the whole song, uh, for those who... This is such a side note, but I love this. Yeah, um, I, I want you to say this, because this is awesome. This song <laughs> that's used on the soundtrack, if you listen to the first half of the song, it is so completely different than the second half. It's like the guy took two different songs, mashed them together, and it shouldn't work because it's so different, but at the same time, it so absolutely incredibly works. Yeah, would you say it's kind of more like the first half is like a Bobby Brown run DMC type, like a lot of drums kicking, and then the second half is more like the Moody that we were singing? It's kind of what it feels like. Yeah, I would say it's uh, the first half is totally pop pop rock for the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that second half is just like, wow, this is different. It's kind of like a a dark wave, like a kind of a feel to it, like you might have heard like maybe more in like the the early 90s as like things were starting to get a little bit darker with with things but it's so mm. it's so weird when i look at that image of carnage i just hear the second half of that song uh come to mind and it works perfectly well with seeing carnage flying over the city oh yeah i 100% agree <laughs> i'm so glad you know it's it's a funny thing when uh you watch a movie so many times that somebody just randomly sings a bit of it, and you're like, okay, I can sing along with all of this right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Ghostbusters were definitely one of those movies. And I, 
will say, too, when it comes to Maximum Carnage, is that the attempt, at least, was made to do something interesting. Really, the attempt was made to just, like, show a character that is dark, like, very dark, who just has no ambition and no motivation other than to cause chaos and pain. But, you know, when I read the forward to the comic, that was put in here. The writer who... Let's see who did the forward here as I read it. It was by uh, Jane Dematius. Yeah. And he says here, Did we succeed? Depends on who you talk to. Some people thought Maximum Carnage was excessively violent. That we subjected our readers to too much darkness before we reached the light. Others opined that you can't really appreciate the light until you take in the trip through the dark. That the ending of our story would not have seemed half so hopeful and uplifting if our characters hadn't crawled through the uh, mire to get there. The truth, I suspect, lies where it often does, somewhere in between. No, that is not an accurate paragraph. Because uh, <laughs> the problem was not that the, it was too dark. As a matter of fact, the, the problem is that it's just very mixed in here in the sense that the darkness doesn't seem to be consistent. Or it just seems mismanaged. Like Mary Jane, like we mentioned, she's supposed to be dark and moody, but it's done in a stupid way. And then the, the darkness of, like, Carnage just killing everything doesn't work when you just keep talking about it because then it just seems corny. So no, this isn't, despite like the violence that happens here and people dying, because Carnage does have an oppressive body count. But this comic isn't dark at all because they completely botched the tone of it. That's fair, yeah. So, I mean, that's where, again, my problem comes from. I, I've read dark comics, you've read dark comics before. Heck, I've read dark horse comics. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've read dark comics before. This is not a dark comic. Watchmen is a dark comic. This is not. Yeah. I would say if anyone's going to go read this, just go into it bravely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just realize that, you know, uh, there's nothing... You don't have to hate it. Just, you know, it's just not going to live up to maybe your expectations. And that's it's really all you need. That's what I went into it with. That's what it did. It's fine. I'm not angry. Yeah, I... <laughs> I'm, I'm more frustrated, because um, when you see people's work being put together on such an ambitious project, you really want to see it turn out well, and you want to enjoy it. And there's so much to enjoy about Spider-Man, Venom, and in Carnage as a villain. There is really a lot you could enjoy about this. It's just, like you said, a missed opportunity. And, you know, if I had to... if I had, I, I hate number grades, because they don't always help. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, if I had to just give it a recommendation at all, I would say... Don't go out of your way to buy it. Um, if you can find a couple of the comics that are included in, it, in a comic store, always support your local comic store. Um, yeah. Pick up a couple of them if you find it. And just give it a read and see what, you know, see about the tone. You'll, you'll see it from there. But that's what I would say. If you can find a couple of the comics at your local store, pick them up, give them a read through, um, try to enjoy them for what they are, and then, you know, give it a day at that. Yeah, I agree. So any closing thoughts, my friend? Um, just support your local comic book store, like uh, Web said, and, you know, if you see Carnage, pick it up. All right. So, for both myself, Web, the Critical Android, and Stefan, we do want to thank you again for tuning in. As we've mentioned with the previous one, this episode will be up uh, on different podcasting sites, as well as uh, on YouTube, where you can still see footage of me probably failing miserably at Maximum Carnage, because that <laughs> game is so hard. <laughs> But you can also uh, eventually find this on a, on a separate YouTube channel where we'll be uploading that eventually. Do you want to hear your feedback and suggestions? If there's something you want us to cover, if there's something you feel that needs to be discussed that hasn't been discussed uh, discussed enough, whether it be horror, uh, horror films, TV, something in comics or video games, just let us know because there's so many corners of this uh, this little tomb and crypt that we've created here that we want to be able to explore every nook and cranny of it with you. Yeah, and even if it's something that's just really bizarre or rare or you think, man, nobody's ever heard of this, I want to hear them cover it, I, I'd like to hear that because there's, there's always more to explore, and I'm definitely willing to do that, especially with Web. We have a lot of fun. We really do, and as, if you've heard from our discussion, uh, we, we go on tangents that we both enjoy to try to like, you know, just mix things up or also because the conversation just kind of naturally flows there. Uh, but that's one of the fun things about having discussions with people who you really love and appreciate and respect is that you, uh, you you get to explore these things and have some fun with it. And we want to continue to have that fun with recommendations that you pose, whether it's something we're not familiar with or something we're so familiar with, but just have been waiting for a chance to discuss. Mm -hmm. Hit us with it. We're ready. <laughs> we are indeed. 
So, for both myself and Stefan, thank you for entering the Crypt of the Unknown. We will see you again, but until then, the Crypt is closed.